All right, welcome back to the program. Johnson Chuku is joining me right now. He's the group managing director at uh, Carry Assets Management. Good morning, uh, Chief Chuku. <laughs> welcome to the program. Can you hear me and can you see me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I can see you. I can hear you loudly and can see you clearly. Good morning, Chief well, Nancy, and thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the welcome to the program. Let's get started and let's start with what is on the screen right now, the multidimensional poverty index uh, report. Many of us have seen the report. Some of us have read it, you know, line by line. Uh, but I would like you to explain in simple terms in just like a minute to many Nigerians that do not even understand what that report is about. Explain in simple terms what the multidimensional poverty index report means. Okay, once again, thank you for having me. Uh, the multi-index uh, poverty, uh, multi-dimensional poverty report, basically, what? Okay, I can see that the uh, connection is freezing there. Let's uh, quickly. I'll take another break, and when we return, uh, we will be speaking again. We'll try to reconnect with John Sinchuku, the GMD at Carry Asset Management. Do stay. All right, welcome back to the program. Just before the break, I was as, uh, I asked uh, Johnson Chuko, the Group Managing Director at Carry Asset uh, Management, about the multidimensional index report that was released by the National Bureau of Statistics last week. Um, Mr. Chuko, can you speak on that? I, I did say earlier at, for you to explain in simple terms what the multidimensional poverty index uh, report uh, means. Okay, once again, um, apologies for the break in transmission. I think my network has been quite, it was unstable at that point. So what I was saying is that um, the multidimensional poverty index is basically measuring the lack of access to certain basic necessities of human existence that Nigerians have. And they're saying that about two third of Nigerians lack access to basic human needs, such as having access to enough food, having access to proper sanitary uh, facilities, having access to education, um, having access to he good health care facilities, and that the more distant you are from having access to, um, to good health care facility means you are uh, poor in terms of health-wise. The more uh, lack of access, you, you don't have good sanitary, wear, uh, sanitary uh, facilities, simply you are poor in that aspect. You also have uh, a financial poverty, which means you don't have enough financial resources to then live a decent life. And then you have poverty when it comes to access to food. So what they have done is to add the multiplicity of what you need for a decent and proper existence. And they're saying, look, if you don't have access to some of these basic necessities of life, you are poor. And they have looked at them. Um, many Nigerians, about two thirds of Nigerians, about 65% of Nigerians have lack access to two or three of these key critical human existence uh, requirement for proper and decent human existence. That's basically what they measure. That's what they talk of, talk of multi-dimensional. That's just not just one dimension. Previously, most measures of poverty were measuring on financial uh, assets or having access to economic resources or financial resources. Like most of the measures we have looked at, we are looking at having that if you don't have access to up to $1.9 a day, that you are considered to be extremely poor. But now they also say, look, beyond having access to income, you may 
also realize that you don't have access to good health care. So if you are sick and you don't have access to good health care, that means you are poor. If you don't have access to good water supply, you are poor. If you don't have access to good educational facilities like children, then in the case of Nigeria, where you have more than 67% uh, uh, of Nigerian children do not have access to good uh, educational facilities. Uh, that they also among us are considered as extreme uh, poor, poor people who are considered as poor. So people who live in rural areas are considered to be poorer because many of them don't have access to good, good health care facilities, they don't have access to good quality education, they don't have access to uh, good uh, um, um, sanitary facilities. That's what this measure is talking about. That for any, an average Nigerian, do you have lack access to good medical facilities? Do you have access to good sanitary uh, facilities? Do you have lack access to good uh, um, um, educational facilities? If you have two, or if you lack access to two or three of these, you are considered to be multi-dimensionally poor. Okay, okay, Mr. Chuku. Um, um, I, I lost uh, a bit of what you said. I don't think it's from you, but I, I just lost uh, a bit of what you said towards the end. But let me go to the next question and ask if, um, if this report really gives us a, a, a clarity of the situation of the poverty condition in the country. And the B part of the question is, were, were you surprised when that report uh, was released? Because I've also spoken to a few people and they did tell me, Nancy, we know that these things exist. It's just that it's now, you know, in, in paper and perhaps telling us where exactly uh, this, uh, the poorest people in the country really reside and all of that. Were you surprised? And do you think that this gives us a clear understanding of the poverty situation in the country? Yes, Nancy, I think it does. Um, uh, it, it, for me, it should be a working tool for the government to ad ad begin to address the okay. issue of poverty in a more holistic manner. Um, yes. If you was I expected, was I surprised? I would say no, in the sense that this is more of a consolidation of the several facets of poverty that we see, we touch, and we feel in this country. Uh, if you go to the rural areas uh, and you realize that most rural areas communities do not have access to medical facilities, uh, my town is lucky to have that, but I know people who commute 20, 30, 40 kilometers to get to they have in my town. And you can imagine if somebody is in a critical situation, you will die because before you get to the nearest medical facility. So that means that poverty has manifested itself in you losing your life. So it wasn't surprising to, to, to me because what has happened is Nigeria seemed to have uh, uh, suffered what you call arrested development. In the 80s, the priority was to make sure you have healthcare facilities, at least basic healthcare facilities at the, all the new sacrifices of the country in each locality. But it seems to have we have forgotten that today we have gradually become uh, the poverty capital of the country of the world in terms of access to education. Nigeria has the highest number of uh, school age children who are out of school. So that's a manifest. We all know this, and we talk about it every day. We talk about the figures now and then. And then you talk of the issue of access to food. We know a lot of Nigerians are actually finding it difficult to feed themselves. So it's a consolidation of the facets of poverty we all feel that sometimes we tend to ignore. Like I said earlier, it should be a working tool for the government to address poverty in a holistic manner. If you know, look at what has happened in other countries like China, like what India is going through now, if you provide, if people are availed uh, good water access to uh, good water supply, access to good sanitary uh, facilities, free uh, access to education, quality education, and they are, have free access to medical, basic medical facilities, they will not uh, that we won't have the level of mortality we have today. We will have the level of poverty we have today because you, in that case, you don't need your own direct cast athlete to enjoy some of these basic needs of human endeavor. Mm. Okay, if we take a look at these numbers, really, do you think that these numbers add up, bearing in mind that this administration is one administration that has touted uh, that it has created social intervention programs, the cash conditional transfer, uh, is, uh, is there the school children feeding program is also there. This is an administration that has spent about $700 million on a social intervention. And I'm actually scouting for how the $700 million have been spent and on those it has been spent on. If we take a look at the survey that was done by the NBS and its partners concerning this report, it was said that 56,610 households uh, were surveyed. Do these numbers really add up? 
Because if government is saying that we're spending billions of Naira on social intervention, yet poverty is increasing, or has increased, rather. But I also need to put a caveat there and bring in this also to your analysis. We know that this government suffered two recessions and also one pandemic, COVID-19, lockdown and all of that. So I'd like you to really holistically look at all of this also in the terms of how those monies have been spent. And the numbers we're seeing is startling. 133 million Nigerians are very poor. Okay, Nancy, the way I would look at it is that uh, this report should actually be a wake-up call to the, for, the, for the government. Uh, in the first place, we should realize that the efforts so far dissipated on an attempt to fight poverty is now, has not worked. Uh, if the number of people that are uh, suffering from multidimensional poverty is about 133 million versus the present of the Nigerian population, then you can clearly say that the intervention that the government has done, uh, the same intervention they've done, have not been effective. And why are they not effective? Because they are ephemeral. They have not touched on the fundamental issues that are impeding on the welfare of Nigerians. The handouts have never been an effective means to fight poverty. In the first place, I have said this uh, several days at your, uh, your, your program, that if we want to fight poverty, we need to create employment. That's how countries fight poverty. You must have come up with economic policies that will engender uh, productive activity in the economy so that com people who are willing and able to work can get jobs. That way they will feed their families. The other thing you do is to provide basic social amenities so that people do not have to spend their money to get those things. If you have pipe bomb waters in your homes, like we used to have in the 70s, but you hardly see any city today in the country that has pipe bomb water distributed to homes. If you have good sanitary uh, facilities, elsewhere in the world, they have central uh, sewage systems where uh, sewage is treated centrally and, um, uh, and possibly used for other uh, agricultural act activities or even energy su supply sources. If you have access to good health care, and let's even look at the $700 million or so they have spent. Assuming you had used this $700 million to build uh, uh, health care facilities, uh, what primary health care facilities and health centers in 700 wards in the country or 700 uh, um, localities in the country, uh, COVID-19 or whatever, or the two recessions wouldn't have taken them away. They would have been there providing basic medical facilities to the rural dwellers. And then the, the level of poverty would have been reduced. Assuming we have spent that money to provide education to the over 10 million out-of-school children, be there uh, uh, recession or not, those children would have gotten some education. This is eight years of the current government. And if they had gone through eight years of education, they would have gone through the basic education uh, that you require for some level of decent living. So the key thing is that we have been spending, spending uh, intervention funds in ways that have not impacted on reducing poverty. And the, as far as I'm concerned, we need to, uh, it should be a wake-up call for us to say that this is not working and what should work. And then we'll come up with something that works address the foundation of fundamental issues about uh, uh, that causing uh, poverty. Create opportunity for people to have uh, access to food at reasonable cost. And to do that, we need to address the issue of insecurity in the country that has displaced a lot of farmers and made them uh, now, instead of be being farmers, they're now dependent on handouts for existence because they now live in internally displaced uh, camps. So if you address those things, then whether there was a uh, um, recession or not, we wouldn't be found access where we are today because we need to build those structures that will allow Nigerians, give Nigerians the opportunity to live decently. Mm. Mr. Chuku, how do you think that moving forward, the, the question or the, the condition around flooding uh, and also these ongoing insecurity concerns will affect the poverty situation in Nigeria earlier on? I did uh, read out during the business news. In fact, uh, I was sent that report by the IMF a few days ago, uh, warning Nigerians that food prices will still go on the increase because of flood and all of that. How do you think that this will even impact the poorest of the poor uh, in the country uh, moving ahead? Also last week or so, yes, last week, I did have an interview uh, with the UN chief in Nigeria, Dr. Matthias Male. And he did, you know, he gave me some startling numbers, startling statistics, which I know they are not just numbers, they are human beings. And he did say that 19 million Nigerians are at risk 
of being food insecure in uh, of being food insecure and three million of those 19 are even in lagos that is the commercial and nerve center and 600,000 Niger nigerian children at risk of of starvation being starving so if you hear this kind of statistics which i know that they are human beings it's not just numbers for numbers sake how do you think that all of this will really affect the poverty situation uh, um, moving ahead you know, uh, uh, what I would say is that uh, you are spot when you talked about um, the issue of uh, flooding, impact of flood and insecurity that we have on worsening the poverty level in the country. Um, you, you observe that because of the flooding, which has not manifested in the increase in food prices, that should, we should expect in the next couple of months and up to the second or third quarter uh, of next year. Uh, rice uh, production is going to decline uh, precipitously. Uh, some tuba uh, production will also decline. Uh, things like uh, cassava, uh, um, yam, potato may have been lost uh, during the um, during the flooding. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the basic cons uh, cons con con consumer items on the average household in the country. So, which then means that their price will go up further. And we know the impact of inflation on the, the standard of living. So if, for instance, the income of the average, uh, averagely poor person in a country is not going to improve because new, no new employment is being created, opportunities for uh, economic activities are, are declining, and then at the same time, price, food prices are going to go up because of shortage of supply uh, occasioned by uh, flooding, then you can imagine that this, uh, the, uh, the wealth condition or the poverty level of those people will uh, uh, deteriorate further. And then add to that the issue of insecurity. I had mentioned earlier that we are now witnessing a situation where people in, that used to be in the farm, who are used to be productive and producing food that we are, they were even selling part of their surplus uh, production, are now depending on handouts for their source of livelihood because they live in IDP camp. So if we don't address and fight frontally or address um, conclusively the issue of insecurity, um, we are not going to address the issue of shortage of uh, food supply in the country. If you look at food inflation in the month of October, it was at least 3.72%. Um, I compare that to what it was October last year, which was about 17.71%. Uh, so you've seen a material increase in food in, in, in index and a, uh, food inflation index, which will worsen uh, in the coming month because of, uh, because of the flooding. So uh, if you put that together, you will realize that why the misery index of Nigerians are worsening. Of course, we know the misery index is due of unemployment and, uh, and, and, and the inflation. And these two uh, seem to be worsening. So clearly, um, Nigerians should brace up for harder periods. Uh, if, um, and unfortunately, the government does not even have the wherewithal to kind of intervene in this, uh, on this issue. Because ideally, what government should do is to release what they, they, they hold in the silos and bring possibly import food to replenish what they have in the silos and ensure that uh, supply uh, improves so that prices do not skyrocket. Now, since we're talking about prices, inflation at 21.09%, and you alluded to the fact earlier that food inflation is uh, currently on uh, the rise. How do you think that we can really attack this inflation, not even taming or fighting it now? We should attack it from all fronts. But this is a country that is still uh, plagued with ins pockets of insecurity across the whole country as we speak. Let's also uh, put that in context with the multidimensional reports that we just got from the NBS that has told us that many states in the north are among the poorest states in the country as we speak. Sokoto State is the poverty capital of uh, Nigeria as, it's, as, we, as we have right now, Bayelsa State, Yobe, and a few other states. Almost all the states in Nigeria are poor. It's just a degree <laughs> is the percentage that, that matters. So if you want to put that into context, how are you going to really analyze those figures uh, that we're getting in relation with food prices are moving uh, forward and these are farmers that they are purchasing powers or even their incomes have been eroded also because of the flood which you mentioned earlier okay what i would say is that to fight inflation uh, in the country we have to look at the root cause of inflation pressure we are witnessing today uh one of which we have we have we have we have uh, touched on repeatedly in this in this particular program 
which the issue of food insecurity occasioned by um, displacement of the farmers in the farming belts of the country. And then um, uh, if we don't address the fundamental problems of inflation, what is perpetuating inflation or what is affecting inflation, then we really can't fight it by using monetary policy tools, which uh, the MPC has been trying to do and it has been consistently unsuccessful. But um, look, looking at um, the issue of uh, fighting inflation beyond the issue of um, uh, addressing the food supply, uh, because what we are witnessing today is that inflation pressure is driven by supply bottlenecks. Uh, it's not driven by credit expansion. It's, not, it's driven by excess liquidity occasioned by credit expansion. It's not driven by supply bottlenecks. So we must address the supply bottlenecks. And uh, critical to that is the supply of food, uh, which for me is the greatest pain, pain point for Nigerian households. Because if you look at the consumption pattern of the average Nigerian household, it's largely food that they spend their money on. Uh, the other factor propelling inflation is the pastoral effect of uh, depletion of the local currency, uh, which has manifested in the price of uh, refined petroleum products. Uh, of course, we know there's elevated price of refined petroleum products globally because of the war. But beyond that, you are looking at the pastoral effect of depletion of the local currency, which is why you today you see all the imported items are coming to the uh, shop floors at higher prices. Because once you import, your currency depreciates, you have to convert the uh, import cost uh, of that item in your local currency and it lands at a, low, a higher Naira value. So you have to deal with that. And then, the, of course, to deal with the issue of pastoral effect of uh, depletion of local currency, you not, need to address the issue of supply of foreign currency and foreign reserve. And to address that, you have to address the issue of crude supply, of crude production, sorry. Uh, of course, we know the government is trying to use uh, unorthodox means to fight the breach of pipelines and stealing of uh, crude. If that succeeds, we should have an improvement in crude production, which will help us uh, uh, improve our foreign exchange earnings and help us stabilize the currency. If we have a stable exchange rate, then uh, core inflation rate will moderate, and then you know you are dealing with the supply of food items, which the government can only address if we address the issue of insecurity in, in most, most regions, no longer in the northern region of the country, because even the southern region, some of the southern regions are affected. Okay, um, let's take a look at the MPC meeting that starts today. I guess it's on the way right now. Um, what do you think will be the mindset of uh, the MPC members as they go into the meetings today or as they are currently meeting right now? What do you think their mindset will be and uh, what is your uh, prediction or forecast for uh, interest rates or all the rates across board? Bearing in mind that at the last meeting, the MPC did raise interest rate to 15.5%. We also have the uh, CIRR uh, that was raised. The MPC did say this was done in a bid to address inflation. But that inflation is also still rising. <laughs> Since September, they, they did raise the rate. So do you see the MPC raising rates again? Like I did ask the governor of the central bank, I remember on that September, I said, if inflation continues to increase, will you continue to increase interest rates? So what do you think that will be done? at the end of the meeting tomorrow. OK, Nancy, what I will say is that what I would rather, the way I would approach it is my own thoughts. Good thing the meeting is today and tomorrow, so they will also put it in their, as part of their concentration in taking a final decision on what they should do or what they will do. Uh, we've seen consistent, we've seen a 400 basis point increase in uh, monetary policy rates. We've seen an increase in the cash reserve ratio from 7.5% to 32.5%. Um, about 200 uh, and, and, and 250 basis points or so. And then that has not tamed, those factors have not tamed the inflationary uh, pressures. And because, like I said earlier, the inflationary pressure is not driven by uh, liquidity uh, overhang, occasioned by credit expansion. Uh, what, what they have succeeded in doing is that they have actually uh, withdrawn or constrained the level of liquidity in the banking system. And today, interest rates bank rates uh, interest that is in the region of 30 percent what that means is that nobody will borrow for productive activities at 30 percent so you're going to shut down the productive sector of the economy if you continue the current uh, trajectory and if you do that you are going to push this economy into a recession and that will not address the problem we have with inflation because the inflation is not driven by credits so sucking up uh, liquidity from the banking system 
and denying producers, manufacturers access to credit will not address the problem we have in inflation rates. If we want to address that, it has to be at the fiscal end of it. And I have said this, we need to address the issue of insecurity in the northern regions of the country, some part of the southern regions of the country. So I think the Monetary Policy Committee must consider the fact that if they continue to contract liquidity from the banking system and deny the productive sectors of the economy credit, we are going to shut down the economy and they're going to push the economy into a recession. So they must balance the need to fight inflation, which unfortunately is not working. If you recall, in April last year, uh, this year, when they started fighting inflation with the, by increasing the monetary policy rate by 150 basis points, the inflation rate was 16.82%. Today, we're talking of inflation rate of 21.09%. We've seen three increases in inflation in interest rates. We've seen a further contraction in all uh, monetary policy uh, instruments. And then you have not seen a moderation in inflation rate because inflation is driven currently by supply bottleneck, by supply shortfall, not by credit. If there's any liquidity coming into the system, it's not coming from credit expansion. It is coming from the central bank ways and means funding of the federal government, which is in injecting liquidity uh, into the economy that is not backed by productive activities. So continuing to fight inflation using uh, monetary policy contraction tools will not address it. Let's address the inflationary pressure from the core of it, which is supply bottleneck. And I think they must put that on their table in taking a final decision on what they want to do. So if they put this on their table, I think the most appropriate decision they will take is to hold rates at current levels. Okay. Mr. Chuku, we have just, uh, I think, two minutes or three minutes to end the show. And let me uh, put in those two or three questions for you. So you have a few seconds to answer. Uh, of course, you were a former bank uh, uh, MD. How do you think that the 15.5% interest rate, which we uh, saw, uh, the rate hike in September, how do you think that that has impacted a loan default? And in if the central bank's MPC did do raise interest rates at the end of the meeting tomorrow, how do you think that that would uh, further worsen it? Um, okay, is Mr. Chuku still there, I guess? Because I can't see him again. Oh. Okay, Mr. Chuku, you're still there. Okay, so loan default uh, risk one. Then number two, I haven't spoken with you since the CBN said it's going to be redesigning uh, the, the uh, three occurrences. How do you think that that would impact inflation? Then number three, uh, the Minister of State for uh, Budget and National Planning, Clem Agba, did say that the federal government will set up a national poverty dashboard situation room because of that poverty report that were, was released what do you uh, have to say about that in less than two minutes, if you can? Okay, less than two minutes, we go. Um, in terms of uh, loan defaults, there's always a delayed response when it comes to loan defaults. I'd mentioned that interest rates in the banks is about 30% today. And there's no product. If you look at the asset conversion cycle of a, a typical manufacturer, it takes more than 90 days. It's only that level of interest is only suitable to traders who have asset conversion cycle of maybe 30 days or, or for five days. Uh, so you are going to see default at a later date uh, when uh, returns, when the people who have borrowed money can no longer are not generating even profits at the level of interest they are paying. So that will come later, and we should prepare for that. They're going to see an increase in number of million in the bank's balance sheets. On the issue of the redesign of the local currency, uh, um, I, 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 I seem to support that because of some of the issues that the central bank governor said, including the issue of fighting corruption, denying access to uh, people who have gotten access to money as a result of criminal activities, drugs, uh, people who have set aside money to buy votes and therefore compromise our electoral process, or people who have got collected money from kidnapping activities. I think that, uh, based on those uh, submissions, I support that. Of course, today, we must recognize that this castlet policy has actually led to a reduction in the level of armed robbery in the country. In the past, you used to have people are afraid that armed robbers will come to their homes and the demand for cash. But no armed robber goes to any home today because there's no cash to be taken there. So some of these policies will have some level of moderating effect on, on criminal activities. Then on the minister's uh, uh, statement on setting up uh, a poverty uh, uh, listing, I think um, they, they should first of all start by looking at this multidimensional uh, poverty index and use it as a template 
to work around on, on how to reduce poverty in the country. Uh, setting up a poverty database or whatever you call it uh, is not so critical. What matters is that we have a template on how to work out uh, the ways of reducing poverty in the country. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chuku, for joining us today. I actually thought you would be in Qatar uh, to watch the World Cup, but since Nigeria is not represented, uh, but some of us that are football fans, I have a, fr a few friends that have gone to Qatar. Whether Nigeria goes or not, they will go, they will go and watch. So I'm surprised you are still here in Nigeria, but we'll support our, our other African our brothers. Mr. Chuku, what do you have to say about that? Well, um, you wouldn't know if I'm a beer drinker that refused to go to Qatar because they, they are not serving beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but they are not serving in the, in the, in the stadium, but they will do that in designated uh, places. A factor. It's a factor for those who yeah. refuse to go to Qatar. But the most important thing that uh, we are actually underperforming in some of the areas that we are not worldwide. Mm. I was in uh, Stanford uh, earlier in the year, and all the uh, classmates were asking, Nigeria is not coming to the World Cup. What happened? Because Nigeria used to be a force to reckon with in football. And these are some of the uh, symptoms of our decline as a nation that we must fix as the election is coming in next year's election. Thank you very much, Mr. Chuku. Let's speak again sometime soon. Have a, a great week ahead. All right, I've been uh, speaking with Johnson Chuku, who is the Group Managing Director at Carry Asset Management, and we've been looking at a potpourri of issues, and we'll try as much as possible to link all of those topics which we uh, looked at. Thank you all for being a part of the show today. Please join us again tomorrow for a, a, a fresh edition of Moneyline with Nancy. Be the best you can be and be the change that you want to see. I am Nancy Naji. Bye for now.